Welcome to Empower Humans. Welcome again to the Empower Humans podcast. This is episode 117, my friends. Here we are with Carson Tate today. She is founder and managing partner of Working Simply. Uh, she helps people find more joy and significance and meaning in their jobs and work situation, whatever that might be. It doesn't really matter whether you're a nurse or you work at Taco Bell. And by the way, we talked a lot about Taco Bell for some reason. I grew up on Taco Bell with single dad and things like that. But, uh, you know, people work at Taco Bell. Some people eat at Taco Bell and things too. Uh, I don't want to focus too much on that in our intro here, but she has a book coming out called Own It, Love It, Make It Work, uh, coming October 2020 here. Pre-order, or if you're listening to this after October, go pick it up. And uh, also she has a virtual event coming up in September. You can find all this stuff at carsontate.com, C-A-R-S-O-N-T-A-T-E.com. And we talked about all kinds of things in this interview. You're going to have to listen to get the the fullness of it. But uh, having patience with ourselves and with each other, learning to communicate properly, learning to reframe situations uh, effectively as well. And just a whole plethora of stuff that we discussed together. And I think we can all get a lot out of this. Uh, of course, I'm biased. This is our show. Uh, but I'm trying to, and Carson as well, we're trying to bring value to you. Uh, most of us do some sort of work in our lives, whether you're self-employed, whether you work at Taco Bell, whether you work wherever. Uh, it's uh, It can all be meaningful, fulfilling work. And uh, as we move along here, getting into this episode, just want to quickly remind you, as always, you are absolutely priceless. No matter your situation, no matter your job, whatever the case might be right now, if you're suffering, and a lot of us are, let's just face it and own it. As part of the title of her book, let's own that this is what's going on in the world. Uh, but you're priceless regardless. That can never change, no matter what's going on, no matter what people say, think, do, or have around us. It's a never-ending state that uh, all of us have as human beings. And that what that means is we're above the monetary systems of this world uh, without price uh, as it concerns all the ultimately meaningless just stuff here. We can enjoy it. We can have fun with it. But who we are and what we are supersedes that. And along with that, and uh, I think applicable to these times, especially, you are not alone. You're not alone in maybe you lost a job, in kids having to stay home for school. I'm dealing with that as well. Uh, health situations and other stuff. Just remember, you are priceless and you're never alone. And reach out if you need help. Reach out, info at empowerhumans.com, at empower101 on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, again, friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, roommate, whatever your situation might be. There are many, many around us who are willing and eager to help. It's in our nature as people to want to help each other, believe it or not. Sometimes we forget that in our society, but it's time that we wake up and, and realize that and and offer that as well to each other. And our challenge is, of course, study, keep studying. Go find Carson's book and uh, do all the things there to uh, better ourselves as it, as it applies to our work situation and earning an income and working with others. I've still got my boys reading uh, some books that they picked out on uh, the Libby app and also we use Hoopla Digital I've mentioned in the past on the podcast. Uh, these all plug in through the local library system. So check in your area if you're not using these apps yet. There's tons of books, audio books, uh, even videos and music in a lot of cases that you can partake of in some capacity. Uh, so find those resources. And of course, we've got all kinds of other free resources, uh, lots of free books available and audio books, Google, Audible, all these things. Uh, just study, stimulate that mind. Very, very important. The second challenge, let's make great moments. That's, uh, as usual, with loved ones generally. And uh, you can find more loved ones in your world as you expand relationships and job opportunities and stuff as well. But always make great moments with these people. Find uh, a lot of what she talked about here kind of early on in the podcast. We talked about what's, what's called the platinum rule uh, as opposed to just the golden rule, which is very important. But the platinum rule is do unto others as they would have done unto them. In other words, what are the things that people need? My son's really into Legos. So what do we do together? We do Legos. You've heard me talk about this. Uh, my other son right now is really into uh, Fortnite and things. And uh, we all love riding bikes. We ride bikes together. It's not all we do all day long, but we have these moments that we spend together that are pillars that overshadow some of the other maybe nonsense or misbehavior <laughs> or whatever might go on throughout the day. So make great moments, surprise somebody, bring them flowers, send a car, leave a note on the bathroom mirror for your significant other, uh, whatever uh, you might need to do. And by the way, that might be a nice thing to do for kids once in a while. Leave a note of I love you and appreciate all these great things. Maybe list uh, five or 
10 things about them that you love and appreciate and admire. Uh, and these just go the distance in making our lives uh, count and matter and and feel good regardless of what's going on. Uh, so make those great moments, study, and of course the last challenge, let's keep doing this podcast together. I can't uh, say enough about Carson Tate here and this great, great interview that we had. I will point out there was some background noise. She has a dog <laughs> that uh, got a little feisty in the background. Uh, we chatted a little about that for a minute or two. But, uh, you know, it's the world we're in right now. People are working from home. People have dogs. I love dogs. So uh, we got to have the dog in on the podcast today as well. But a lot of great, great, great insightful material from her uh, as it concerns uh, working, jobs, uh, relationships with others, and how that relates to other things too, families, uh, marriages, you know, with our kids and all those various things. So without further ado, my friends, let's jump right into the interview. Here we are with Carson Tate. Here we go. We are privileged today to welcome Carson Tate, who is a uh, founder and managing partner of Working Simply, also author, speaker, all kinds of great things. Carson, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Phil. Thanks for having me on your show. <laughs> Good. My pleasure. I uh, I find it interesting that uh, you work with work <laughs> and people <laughs> in their jobs. And, uh, you know, especially in light of everything going on in the world, I think it's uh, an important topic, especially now, but always because work's part of, I think it should be, all of our lives in some form or another. You're coming to us from the East Coast kind of region, right? North Carolina? North Carolina. And as we were talking about, it's just as hot here as it is, I think, for you. Oh, in is Las it? Las Vegas. Yes. We have lovely hot weather in the summer. Are you humid out there? Does it, I mean, it seems like from, from what I've heard, it gets humid. It is very humid. Um, and your female listeners might appreciate this. I mean, it's very good hair days. You might not worry <laughs> about that, but. It is definitely oh. something that I, I am thinking about. <laughs> oh. So the humidity helps a hair day or hurts? <laughs> oh, it's terrible for hair. Oh, terrible for I hair. Figured. Okay. Yes. Oh. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> um, well, interesting. I, uh, I, I wanted to talk to you today and invite you on because of all this. And in light of, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit. A lot of people with, have had some job challenges with everything going on too. Um, but what what is it about like your background that made you want to pursue and do this? Because you've written a book, actually a couple books, another one coming out here soon. Uh, own it, love it, make it work. Right? That's the new right. book. Right. Tell tell That's me what brought you out. to this. Yeah, what brought you to this place where you're, you know, lifting people with their work situation? <laughs> yes, you know, I think I've always been interested. Um, in work, I was growing up, I would set up a little station for myself with my pretend cash register, and I had businesses. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and so work has always been something that has been a central topic in our family. We talk about, and when I got out of undergrad, I went to work for a very large company, financial services company, and I started in human resources. And I loved it because humans, us, <laughs> we are what bring life, right, to work. Yeah. Um, and seeing the impact of policies, both uplifting and policies that maybe weren't so uplifting of the full human experience really intrigued me. Uh -huh. Then I went into outside, outside sales. So I wanted to experience that and realized pretty quickly that the entrepreneurship that was running in my veins, I now know I needed to start my own business. So I went back to my roots around work and helping people be organized and really finding who they are and letting work be the full expression of, of themselves. Got a master's degree along the way in organizational development, which I loved. And that really empowered me to help think more holistically about how and why we work. And as individuals, we have so much personal agency and shaping our work mm -hmm. so that it fits our life and really is in service to the greater world, both our companies, but also the entire community that we live in. Wow. Yeah, that's a great, uh, and sounds like you have a lot of uh, passion surrounding the topic, which is good because <laughs> this is what you do. Um, <laughs> that's, what, that's what we want. Um, I, but let me just say, I like your accent a lot. Uh, you've got a little bit of a, <laughs> are, you from, are you from the region there originally? So originally, I live now in North Carolina, and I'm originally from South Carolina. So uh, yes, um, I do. Yes, <laughs> the neighboring states. Yeah, 
I was. I used and to I do, do ha- definitely have a. Used to. Yeah. No. What were you going to say? No, you tell me you used to do. Well, no, I used to do telemarketing with those people that everyone hates. This was, I don't know, many years ago. We don't even want to count. Early 2000s, <laughs> like 18 years ago. And, uh, but we'd, we'd, so we'd call all over the country. And, uh, but I always enjoyed calling people from North and South Carolina and the South in general because they're like the nicest people <laughs> in my experience. And they didn't hang uh. up on us as much. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I think we're, we're pretty nice and um, we aren't going to hang up on you. We will tell you no thank you and then we'll hang up. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll hang up. Yeah, that will make sense too. You're bringing yes. me back triggers of 18 years ago. Um, but good people. I So, sorry, we're shifting gears, but back to the topic here with work. With so many people out of work right now and or coming back or kind of a sluggish economy, um, like here in Vegas, it was kind of crazy. The whole strip, I was down there um, and we've talked a little bit about this on the podcast. Um, Everything was shut down, all the hotels and everything was, you know, they had even police barricades blocking things off. And that's just in one city. Um, But similar versions of that were playing out all over the country. Uh, So how... How does this play out now? And in light of what you do, obviously, we'll talk more uh, maybe a little bit later on, too, about because it sounds like you, you do some public speaking and events and things as well. And between all those things, concerts, things have been canceled. So talk to me about in light of our current situation, this COVID-19 thing and work. Uh, what are some insights, maybe tips and thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. So. And Phil, you're, we were all seeing it every day. In some ways, I have felt, and I've seen it from our clients as well, that everything changed overnight. It was like yeah. one day we were going to the office, you know, going to concerts, going to the casino, eating out. And then the next day, it felt this way. Everything changed. And so rapid shift, rapid change creates so much anxiety. And what I would offer, a powerful opportunity for us to create something different. I'm not sure the way we worked before this is how we're going to work afterwards. Hmm. And so what we are coaching our clients on, what I'm writing on, what I'm teaching webinars on is what are you going to do with that? How are you going to create work? What work looks like? Because work isn't a place you go. Work is something you do. How are you going to create work that fits in your life? allows you to use your skills, your knowledge. How are you going to do this work that allows you to create the the life that you need? Because now is your opportunity. Everything's in flux. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a, that's a great, great point. And, uh, you know, I was looking at the title of your first book, Work Simply Embracing the Power <laughs> of Your Personal Productivity. And I wonder how much, even though you weren't, you know, looking forward to all that we now are experiencing in 2020 and, you know, expecting all this, how does what you wrote about in that book and that title play in to Mm -hmm. uh, what's going on now, maybe? Well, it, it really does because my first book, Phil, was all about productivity and creating, we call it a personalized productivity toolkit because you and I think differently, we work differently. So, Let's say uh, Trello, it's a great app, works great for you. Well, it might not work great for me, and that's okay. And so the two core premises in that book around that we're all different in how we work played out tremendously in this COVID as you see people adapting and working differently. Mm -hmm. And the second one, just around the core productivity piece, how do you build a schedule? How do you manage your inbox? How do you construct a a task list that works for you? How do you manage your attention in this crazy distraction filled world of working from home? All with really foundational skills that I personally drew on, my team did, and we had to shore up our clients on too. I was like, okay, it looks different, but we still have to use these core foundational best practices around productivity because we still have to deliver. We still got to get the work done. And yeah. we can't do it at the expense of you or your family or your health. So we have to be more productive. Right, right. Yeah, good point. I, I think about it in terms of, uh, you know, families right now. Because 
Uh, I mean, that's kind of the core unit of society uh, and people's family life plays out a little differently. Sometimes there's a divorce, sometimes there's not or, or whatever. Sometimes kids are raised by grandparents, things like that. But with all these various circumstances, um, if there's children involved, there's usually an adult, at least one adult involved. Do we have any insights or thoughts on that as far as, because now kids like here in Nevada, Clark County, where I am, they're going to be doing what they call distance learning, which is mm-hmm. you know, online on a screen. They're, they're divvying out Chromebooks to everybody, uh, right. which is nice. But um, in terms of a parent has to work and then they're used to kids going to school and maybe having an after school program and they can work and pick them up. Do we have any thoughts on that where everyone's confined when it comes to work and now school starting uh, to, to make that more of a smooth process right now? Because no one's used to it, you know. Oh, none of us are used to it. I mean, and I, we're experiencing the same thing. So in our um, community, our our children are doing. Um, we're calling they call it virtual or remote learning. So they're home with, on their computers. And so, three things I would suggest. First, what are you going to do around the distractions for everybody? So, what does this mean in terms of your physical workspace? And what does this mean in terms of your children, your child or children's school space? So that these are distinct and separate zones that when you go to them, and it could just be the end of the kitchen table, because not all of us have the luxury of a, of a room, but when you move into this physical space, that is a transition, not only physically, but mentally, this is a work zone. This is where I'm going to do my school. It's really important that we have this physical space because we aren't having, no longer do we have that transition, that commute to work or that commute into school. So we're going to have to be really intentional about that space. Mm -hmm. The second thing is what we do at work. What are our, this is a work term, but it applies for us with our families. What are the working agreements? So when do I need to take calls for my job? When will you be on Zoom? You know, if that's how you're going to be learning, what does that look like? And how are we going to navigate that? So that could be a schedule that you mm-hmm. put together each week that, that everybody looks at. It's agreements around when you can and cannot interrupt each other. When are we going to take breaks? Right. So it's renegotiating the how you're going to live in that space through the lens of I have to work and I have to go to school. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I appreciate those insights. That's great. I, and I think too, in terms of the, like the parents who may work a job that they're not working from home, maybe they work at maybe one of these restaurants reopened or uh, different things like that. And uh, I don't, I don't know that we have answers for that because kids might need to be home or, or maybe buddy up with a friend from school with their family, at least for school time or something. Do, do we have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think one of the good things that can come from this, oddly enough, is we need to be socially distanced, so to speak, is that in some ways we can still work together and become a little bit closer in our communities with things like that. As far as, okay, a parent does need to go. They, maybe they work at Taco Bell for all we know or something, and, and they've got to go in for that, and they can't do that from home. Uh, so, um, any, any thoughts as far as teaming up in a, as a community? Cause we, we tend to distance ourselves anyway, as Americans It's like, I don't know, sometimes we do help each other out, but sometimes we like to just build our fences and, and <laughs> stay apart. But, and that's part of what Absolutely. we're doing, I guess. But do you have any thoughts on that? Parents who still might have to work out of the home, but then kids are doing school at home. Mm-hmm. Well, and Bill, I think you just hold on what I'm seeing as a silver lining in this really challenging time is it is getting us to think differently about community because I know I know personally I can't do it alone I do need my community to help and so what I am seeing with clients what I'm seeing with friends is this coming together of these smaller pods or smaller groups of children Mm -hmm. and parents and negotiating how together they're going to make sure the children get what they need in terms of their school time, play time. There's the adult support and supervision 
and there's the space if I need to go work at the hospital or talk about if I have to physically go to work that I can do that and my child's being taken care of but you can't do that without being in community yeah yeah and I've seen that too like my son's birthday was this Saturday two days ago uh, he turned 11 ah, that's yeah. 11 that's awesome so is he going in what sixth grade yeah, sixth grade. Sixth uh, grade. He's got oh, one of these August middle school. Birthdays. Yeah, <laughs> and I have an August. I turn a forty, by the way. Here, not that we need to say happy birthday, but I'm used to having the August birthday where we're like the youngest kids in the class and stuff, because uh, that's like the cutoff for the school year. Um, right. And so he has some friends, and I've seen. In fact, it was interesting <laughs> you say that because I kind of I didn't think of it this way, but these some of these pods have kind of naturally formed, and I didn't really consciously. Think about it because he's got, you know, about three or four core friends and three friends came over to our house just to have a little, you know, what we could do for a birthday. And, uh, and so we still have that and I'm in touch with the parents and stuff. And, and I think we all kind of have an understanding if someone needed something that we, we would be, would do our best to, you know, help each other out. Um, so I, I guess I'm uh, underscoring what you're saying. And uh, from life experience Uh, and in light of the birthday uh, party. (laughs) Absolutely. And I do think it's a a beautiful opportunity for all of us. Um, I have a friend outside of Boston who they've got a pod and they've come together to figure out um, who can teach some of the subjects and augment the online or the the remote or distant learning. And um, Mm. they've got some fun activities they've planned. They're near um, some woods. So it takes a little creativity, but such richness and community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm I trying to look at this in a big picture sense that I, I still feel like we're going to be out of this more, hopefully sooner rather than later. Don't quote me on that because I don't know. <laughs> <Neither Yeah>. do. <laughs> but, no, I, I don't have a magic wand or a crystal ball. I don't have either of those. Yeah. I mean, even if it was two years, God forbid, or maybe it's another month or two where oh, things start to open up and there's a, you know, vaccines and things start to disperse and the, you know, we can kickstart the economy better. Whatever the time frame is, it's still, uh, you know, I'm I'm hoping before my son's out of sixth grade, I have another son going into third grade, by the way, that this this will be a somewhat smaller blip on the picture that we can all look back on, you know, hey, remember that COVID thing? Goodness gracious. And, and hopefully have brought some lessons <laughs> from it. And so uh, having said that, I guess I want to discuss further in light of quote unquote normal real world circumstances, what other things you know, as we have some tips is hopefully that we do get back to normal. Uh, Cause I know one of the things you talk about is uh, you say quote Sunday night scaries that people have <laughs> going into work and, and stuff like that. And I thought, well, that's a cute phrase and also probably very uh, apt description of what <laughs> people experience. Why, why do people experience that? And is there any way, whether they're going into work or working from home, regardless with the COVID thing, uh, what are some ways that we can um, minimize Sunday Night Scaries does not sound like a pleasant experience. Oh, no. I mean, I think at some point, probably most of us can relate to that pit of dread in your stomach, like, oh, you know, I have to go back to work on Monday or the Monday morning blues, or how many posters or memes have you seen? And, you know, is it Friday yet? Yeah. And when, yeah, we spend a third of our waking hours at work. That's a pretty a bit way I think to be at work and so there are five key areas that when we're working with our clients and coaching folks if, if you want work to work for you and you don't want any more of the Sunday night scaries there are five things that you need to think about mm-hmm. what are your recognition and reward needs so admit to yourself you know what I do need to be acknowledged for my contributions but what does that look like but, so Phil, you might be the guy that wants, you know, an email blast to the whole company of great job, Phil, for landing this new client. Yeah. Or maybe you're the guy that wants, you know, just a quiet pat on the back. Mm -hmm. But how can you be acknowledged and rewarded if you don't know what it is that you need? So that's the first thing is can you get clear on that? The second thing is around strengths. And we've heard this in business for years. 
And there's a reason for it. Our strengths are where we are really passionate. It's where we excel. But the key with our strengths is this is where we actually have some currency and the relationship with our employer because our strengths are where we add to the bottom line of our company yeah. and our strengths are how we can start to shape work to fit our life. So do you know what they are? Do you know how your strengths contribute to the bottom line of your company, the advancement of its strategic objectives? Once you know that, then you can start to negotiate. You know what? I want to spend more time working on this project. It works. It definitely benefits you and it benefits me. Mm -hmm. I feel strong. I feel good when I work for my strengths. Then the third one is around growth. And you talk about this on your podcast a lot. Are you looking for places to grow and develop professionally? Is it a course? Is it maybe a mentor? Is it job shadowing? How do you want to expand your skill set? Now, right now, we're, we're not in offices. Well, could you take your commute time, your former commute time, and develop a skill? There are obviously plenty of webinars, but there are great online resources that you could use to develop a skill. But yeah. developing and continuing to grow is so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then the fourth one is around relationships with folks. Well, we've already talked about community. And when we think about really making your work work for you and loving your work. It's also about the people you work with. And so I talk about how do you cultivate authentic relationships, those relationships that enable you to shine, you can grow, you're in service. And we talk about using something called the platinum rule. Are you familiar with this? Have you heard this? Uh, no, I'm embarrassed to say no. Go ahead. (laughs) Oh, no. Well, Phil, don't be embarrassed. I just learned this a few years ago. So maybe you're familiar with the golden rule where, um, I remember being taught in kindergarten and then my my parents supported it. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. So the golden rule Mm -hmm. and about being empathetic. Well, I learned a few years ago, a year ago, the platinum rule, which is do unto others as they want done to them. So it's starting to treat others how they want to be treated. So for example, a lot of our clients are doing Zoom calls all day and a lot of check-ins with their team members. Well, some team members do not want to get on a Zoom call and chat about what they've just watched on TV or what they're cooking. They want to get right to work. They see that chat time as a waste of time. So you're not connecting or relating to them in a way that really works for them. So when we start to cultivate authentic relationships, who are we working with? How do they want to be communicated with? What's their work style? And then we tailor our interactions to treat them the way they want to be treated. Yeah. Great. So was the platinum rule the fifth thing, by the way? Oh, no. The fifth thing is around meaning and purpose. And you talk a lot about this. And it's, (laughs) and I'll just say one line on this, because you've got multiple great podcasts on your website around this, is that meaning is defined by you. And so no job is not significant and meaningful, because meaning is how you construct your reality and how you think about the work that you do. And all work in this world is valuable. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I love that. I love the platinum rule. And and I love thinking, again, being a big picture thinker, I try to be. Uh, I, I always look for things that are universal. Like all this stuff applies perfectly in business, uh, regardless of your station in the world. And uh, But I think it also applies in relationships, family, uh, all these things. about. And I think that that fifth thing about meaning and purpose underscores all of it where the Sunday night scaries can be minimized by understanding, you know, like I've read, listened to an audio book called uh, start with why some years ago. And uh, when you, when you have a why, not just the letter Y, but the word W H Y (laughs) a Y that's, that's big enough for what you're doing. uh, That includes all these things about uh, recognition, strengths, growth, relationships, 
um, again, whether it be in the family and or like we're talking about mostly today in business, and then of course the uh, meaning and purpose of it all, then it kind of, it feels like those are pillars that would overshadow some of this just natural human tendency to, oh, I don't want to go into work because, <laughs> because then you've got. Them. Absolutely. So. Yes. And um. it seems like it, it also, there's an element in the interpersonal part of all this of patience, especially right now, because people are adjusting. We're not used to this. Like you said, someone might not be into all these zoom calls <laughs> and so on. Uh, but on, it's kind of a two-way street, right? So the person who's not into it can can just, you know, calmly, nicely, benefit of the doubt, communicate that. And then same on the other end. And we all just kind of work together with, with a nice, cordial environment still instead of blowing up. Because sometimes, you know, people might have a tendency to blow up. Stress things do that. And, and on the, I don't want to derail if you had anywhere you want to go with that, but uh, if you had something to say on that, go ahead. But also, let's talk about stress as it pertains to work. And I think that's some of what we were just talking about, too. But um, stress is such a big, you know, I, I do a lot of keyword research online. And this is one of the big keywords people search for on YouTube and Google is, is getting rid of stress. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Well, and it, uh, well, first of all, let's just acknowledge again and underscore that we are in the midst of rapid, cons- I would say constant change. Yeah. So I have clients, if we use, if we pull on the school thread a little bit, who three weeks ago, this was the plan from their school district. Yeah. Then it got changed and then it got changed again. Mm-hmm. It's not right or wrong and there's no blame. Everyone's doing the best they can with the information they have. But in that environment, your stress is going to be off the charts. Because humans crave certainty. Yeah, good point. And our brains crave patterns. I mean, this is why we, when you watch a movie you've seen a couple of times before, it feels so good. You know the next line. Or when you hear a song on the radio you've heard before, you sing yeah. along, your brain is like, I got this. I'm feeling good. Yeah. And so you know, when you can't, it's really hard. So part of what we're doing with our clients is let's name and claim that this is hard. You're stressed. I'm stressed. The environment that we're living in is stressful Mm -hmm. and we're on ground. We have not tread before. We haven't done this before. And not only is this all new, it constantly changes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, it's the one thing about stress too uh, you know, on the physical plane, it's, you know, if you go exercise, lift weights, whatever, there's an element of physical stress that goes into that. But on the, on the flip side of that, we'll say, is hopefully a development of strength and health and, and, you know, things like that that come through that stressful experience. And so, again, finding purpose in all this, where this rapid change and stress and unexpected things going on, uh, Hope and it's 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 everything's easier said than done, right? Here's a podcast. We're just we're just talk talk talking, but <laughs> right, right. But we, and we've set up the conditions for both of us to be pretty relaxed and you know not stressful for us right now. Yeah, we're just chatting about principles. But when you put them in action, yeah, it's it is easier said than done. It's just uh, looking for that bigger purpose, not just with stress, which is a big topic, but anything finding a bigger, more meaningful. Uh, you know, growth purpose of some sort with, with, uh, with anything. It seems like uh, it's kind of what I guess we're driving at. Uh, yes. But well, we're talking about, I think, learning to just and Phil, I think we're talking about two things. One, how do you reframe the stress so it fits the context of a bigger why in your life? Yes. And I would say tactically, when you are in the midst of an incredibly stressful time, your one thing that, that you can do is look for small places where you can create that certainty and control. So it could be as simple as, as your family deciding, hey, you know what, this is what we're going to eat this week and writing it down. Spaghetti, we're doing PB&Js, right? Because you can actually control that. 
Yeah. So where can you take back that personal agency and, and control in small little ways yeah. that start to give you a less of everything's out of control? No, I've got control over this, 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 and this. And then I'm going to use my energy to reframe the stress in terms of broader purpose. This is a growth opportunity. And right now, you know what? It sucks. I don't really like it. And I'm going to keep going. Yeah. Great point. I think uh, it's all about kind of waking up to the power we do have and taking that initiative. And uh, for some who may not be used to doing that, it can be a a whole world changing thing for them that, okay, I can control, like you talked about the PB and J's and the the thing, but whatever simple or more complicated things in our lives that we can still have patterns and control over uh, and then thereby minimize some of the stress on the other side of things that we have less if any control over as far as like the schools and things like I feel I feel bad for a lot of the folks in the education realm too because in some ways maybe it's easier for them they get to teach from home or maybe they teach from a classroom but they don't have all the kids there throwing stuff and yelling at each other and things like that there's there's good and bad to all of it I guess but uh, I you know I, I I was wondering too as as I look at some of your work here uh, one of the things you talk about is finding uh, meaning and passion through a job. Uh, wh- what do we mean by that? I don't mean to shift gears too much, but it's all in the same vein yeah. of what we're talking about, right? Right. So I'll, I'm going to answer with a story. So I like to, if, if you're open to it, I'd like to tell a quick story uh, of a woman named Celia, who I interviewed for my second book. And so Celia is the unit secretary of the pediatric intensive care unit and the ninth largest hospital system in the country. So I interviewed her before COVID. Mm -hmm. This is a very stressful job, but we could say feel fairly transactional. I mean, Celia's job, she answers the phone. She makes sure the charts are where they need to be. She makes sure medications are routed from the pharmacy to the correct nurse. It's a pretty transactional job. Mm Mm-hmm but she does not see her job that way. When I talked to her, she told me that she was the mother hen of her floor Mm -hmm. and that she was responsible for her nurses, her physicians, her ACPs and her patients. She was there to support them so they could take care of their patients. She was the concierge for these families. If they needed something, she would make sure that she got it for them. Right. So, What she did there is she reframed her work. And so instead of thinking about it as a collection of individual tasks, she thought about it as a meaningful whole that not only served those folks in her direct community, but think about walking out into the world, thinking of yourself as the mother hen who has been in service all day. It's a pretty powerful place to be. So, Work can serve that passion and that purpose, but it does require you thinking about it differently, orienting your task differently, maybe cultivating different relationships. But it goes back to that agency because meaning is not something that's defined by others. You define it. I didn't tell Celia, hey, this would fit really well in my book if you could talk about it this way. No, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? I mean, I didn't, she that's what she had done. Yeah, that's a great story. I, uh, yeah, and I think of that in terms of, you know, everybody has to, uh, has to find this, this purpose. And sometimes that can, I don't want to use this phrase, but for lack of a better phrase, throughout the day, it can kind of suck the life out of you a little bit if you have to be the mother hen, so to speak, in, in her <laughs> case, or whatever these roles are that kind of, it's not just a, mechanical task it's pulling the spirit of what you are out to to be something for people right and that can be Mm -hmm. wearing do we have any any tips as far as uh you know self-care and recharging those batteries i mean there's obvious things we have to get enough sleep we have to eat right and (laughs) exercise anything else in terms of you know creating the right mindset surrounding this and so on Mm -hmm. charging in general so we always coach our clients on making sure that they've got some emotional reset buttons. Yeah. I always tell folks that um, if you're tired, hungry, or pissed off, 
off. Good luck. <laughs> All good intentions fly out the window and productivity takes a nosedive. And you've addressed the um, <laughs> hungry piece and, and rest. We know those. Too. We've all heard those. But I think the key piece in this time and for the Celia's and all of us is okay, you're feeling a little burned out, or you just had a really challenging conversation with someone and you're feeling maybe angry or maybe really sad. What yeah. is the tool that you use to emotionally reset? Well, you've mentioned one, I think movement is one of the most powerful tools to move energy through your body. So maybe that's, you know, a walk around your room or up and down a flight of stairs in your apartment building. Celia could do that. Right. Music, love music. So can you use music to re-energize you, a little dance party and humor? I mean, there's a reason we always laugh about these cat videos on YouTube. I mean, they're ridiculous. Yeah. but they make you laugh. And so part of the, the stress management toolkit is what am I going to do when I'm in that place of emotional burnout or emotional fatigue, or I'm just frankly pissed off. What's my little toolkit there? What am I going to go to and use? Yeah, that's great. And again, it underscores what we said earlier about taking initiative and, and just owning your power, not just, Oh, I have to consign myself to this state of being, tired, hunger, pissed off, as you said, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but okay, I'm feeling this way and it's not going to contribute to uh, productivity and joy throughout everyone's world today. So what are the things I could do? You know, be proactive as Stephen Covey, by the way, I found out the other day on Amazon, his book, The Seven Habits, which came out, I don't know, 25 years ago or more, is still like in the top three selling books. I don't know if it's just in the self-help realm or maybe all, right. all of Amazon, <laughs> And he passed away a few years ago. It's still up there. But anyway, be proactive was the first habit. And this is kind of what you're saying, it sounds like. Uh, Absolutely. But if, and I would say yes and, Phil, I want to add one other thing there. It's proactive preparation because when you are angry and you want to, you know, sock someone in the face, which none of us are going to do. It's not appropriate or even legal. Yeah, I hope not. That's not the moment to trigger out, what am I going to do? And do? How am I going to reset? You want to have those tools already kind of lined up. So when you hit that emotional point, you can pull one out. So it's a, how do I plan and prepare and be proactive in the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's an excellent, excellent point. And I think that applies everywhere. It reminds me, I grew up in kind of a religious environment. And one of the things, you know, in the Bible, there's place where it says, choose ye this day whom you will serve kind of thing, which is like, you know, in advance your general life trajectory. And if this happens, then this is what we need to do about it. It's kind of what you're saying, I think. Um, so again, I guess I'm saying these things apply on all levels, not just with your job, but it applies at home too with your spouse or partner or kids or roommate does something or you start to get used to, oh, they have this habit that kind of also pisses me off that instead of blowing up, punching, throwing something, yelling, that we do this instead, or we schedule a time to chat calmly or, or whatever. It's, it's, it's all about, I love what you're saying because, yeah, in the moment that knee-jerk reaction will come out if we don't have any alternatives in our minds. Oh, no. And I learned this, um, another really quick personal story. I learned this um, in quarantine, Phil. So one night my daughter and I were watching TV and we were eating chocolate covered peanut butter pretzels. I mean, chocolate yeah. and peanut butter. How does yeah. I mean, it's delicious. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I mean, she's chewing so loudly. <laughs> and in my mind, you're a parent, I'm like, oh my gosh, does she always chew this loudly? Where are her manners? Where have I failed as a mom? I mean, I went into this spiral. <laughs> and not only did I spiral through the, all the mom guilt, then, then I went to bah! complete and total. I, I lost it screaming, like, stop chewing so loudly, go to your room for your terrible manners. <laughs> and in that moment, I was like, oh, after I did, I was like, oh, that went good. You, you didn't go to your toolkit. And it also showed me something pretty important that I needed to see is that as we've talked about, my self-care wasn't where it needed to be. Mm. So my own personal tank wasn't as full as it needed to be in that moment to step back to my tool. 
So it's a, it's a, are we also watching in this incredibly stressful time? We might need a little bit extra self care. Maybe it's, it's five minutes extra on your walk. Or I know you've done a couple of podcasts on meditation. Maybe I need to add in a seven minute meditation midday just to help make sure those reserves are high enough that we can make that different choice. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that story and being vulnerable that maybe you fouled up that day, but. Uh, oh, big time. Not yeah. a proud parenting moment. Let me tell you. <laughs> no, but you know what? I, I, everybody fouls up as a parent, a spouse, a, you know, worker or boss or whatever. And, and so I think it's, it's almost important that we embrace that reality too, that, okay, we're going to mess up. And as families too, or teams at work or whatever, that we kind of acknowledge, yes, we want to strive for uh, greatness and perfection, but we are going to fall short sometimes. Maybe being human, we might make a mistake or have a bad emotional moment or <laughs> a reaction to something so that we're all patient also with each other and with ourselves to realize, okay, I've messed up. Let's do what needs to be done. Apologies, uh, forgiveness on one end and move on as well. Um, and, and that's, I've messed up so many times as a parent, I can't even tell you. <laughs> but, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But kids learn too. And then it's like it's, it, it can kind of reiterate the, the depth of the love there too, that, you know what, I messed up. And because I love you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come apologize and fix this and give you a hug and <laughs> whatever. You don't necessarily do, have to do all the hugs at work, especially with COVID going on, but uh some version of a proverbial hug to fix things and make things right. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, one thing that this brings up for me, Phil, that we've been talking to our clients about is how can we in this environment and at work for the sake of our relationships, um, assume honorable intention because mm. our brains have a negativity bias now, and this really is hardwired into us and is really important for survival thousands of years ago, but most places that we live are probably not going to be eaten by a tiger. Now, my inbox feels like a tiger some days, but this is not the same level of threat. But your brain is hardwired to scan and look for the negative. And so we do this with people too. So how can we start to assume honorable intent and reframe and override our brain's negativity bias, which takes training. It's a bustle. And so one thing we've been doing as a family, and I've been sharing more and more with clients, is to do a practice. And you might have heard this. We call it um, a bud, two roses, and a thorn. Okay. And so you can do it as a family. You could even do this in a work context. And so what we do as our family at night the bud is something you're looking forward to. So it could be um, getting to read the next chapter in your book. Maybe you're going for a bike ride with a friend. Something you're looking forward to. Two roses, this is where we're retraining the negative bias of our brain, or two good things that happened to you that day. Maybe two interactions with folks. It could be, you know, I had the best jelly on my PB&J, but it's two roses, positive events. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we have to go deep to find them. Yeah. And then the thorn is an acknowledgement of, of what we've been talking about, that we're all human. We all mess up. We all have disappointments. We all have things that are hard. And so the thorn is that vulnerability with your family or with your team. Super simple yeah. practice that pays some pretty rich dividends. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent points. I like that. A bud, two roses, and a thorn. I, uh, I'm taking notes here as we talk. I, uh, <laughs> it sounds like you got a dog there who might be a little upset. I, I, I do, and I, I apologize. One <laughs> no, no, of the, no, the cool. beauties. I thought he was properly um, contained, and a, apparently not. And this is where I don't know about you, but it, there's been such great vulnerability. Um, as I've been on many calls, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I don't no, know what no, to don't do. Worry about it. I just want to make sure yeah. no one's breaking into your house or anything, you know. No, no. <laughs> um, he probably saw a squirrel and is ever hopeful that he can escape to go get the squirrel. Oh, well, he needs to learn about a bud, two roses, and a thorn and <laughs> get his mind right. right? 
Uh, and get us mind straight, right? And stop this negative thing and assume honorable intentions. Which yeah, is how really does all this apply to dog training? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, it, yeah. Don't ask me. I have clearly failed in that department. <laughs> that, that you need to find a different guest on that one. Well, it's, I mean, when you think about it, again, and from the universal standpoint, dogs need their reward system, and and uh, they may not be all conscious all the time of their strengths and stuff too. But in any case, we're all living creatures where we need these reinforcement things. Uh, along our path. We absolutely do. And yes. Yeah. What, what happens sometimes, because we hit roadblocks, you know, in these journeys that we, we're trying to become a better whatever we are, you know, a nurse or we work at the restaurant or a boss of some sort. Um, but let's define what some of these roadblocks might be that come up and, and what do we do about it? You know, losing mm-hmm. momentum and, and confidence in the way. So maybe let's say, for example, you had a conversation with your boss about using your strengths more and restaurant, nurse, anywhere, we all have strengths. And it was met with silence or your boss said, oh, I'll get back to you on that. And then there's radio silence. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you reach out to someone to develop a relationship, maybe a mentor, you just want to learn more to grow and develop radio silence. What do you do? Well, the first thing that we always tell our clients to do is let's get clear on what happened. So let's go back to the person and reinitiate the conversation because it's so easy to make that assumption. Oh, my boss doesn't care about my development. My boss doesn't care about uh, me using my strengths or that person I reached out to is too busy for me or I'm not worthy of them. So we don't want to go there. So It's a conversation, so it's restarting the conversation, and it's three parts. So you state the facts really neutrally. So let's say it's the boss and the strengths, and you'll be the boss. So, Phil, we had a conversation um, on July 20th about me taking on this additional task so I could use my strengths more in this upcoming project. Mm -hmm. We talked about you thinking about it, and talking to HR if there were any constraints around me doing that. I have not heard back from you since then, and this is the second part. And the story I'm telling myself is that maybe you got busy or maybe you didn't want to share the bad news that I couldn't do this. Help me understand what that's the third part. What is your perspective or help me understand what am I missing? Oh. And then you're quiet. <laughs> that's a, that's a great, like tactful way to communicate though, too. That's not at somebody's throat and assuming the worst, because a lot of times we're wrong when we assume the worst. So you're saying the uh, story I'm telling myself, so you're owning, I'm thinking it's probably this because we have to define things as humans, but uh, because I'm, I'm not, you know, pulling triggers in all directions here, I've got to get your input. This is what I'm thinking. So help me understand. I like that. And I, and again, that's something that can apply in a marriage and in a, <laughs> with, with parenting and all these other things too. So I like that a lot. Um, oh, I used it um, this morning trying to get my nine-year-old. So you've got a third grader. I've got a fourth grader, my nine-year-old, to clean up what looked like a hurricane had been through the bedroom. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. So, shoes on the floor, clothes not hung up. <laughs> the story I'm telling myself, what am I missing? <laughs> yeah. Because ultimately, Phil, when you, hit a, when you hit what feels like a roadblock, professionally or personally, we need to get that other party, that other person back in the conversation. Because without conversation, we can't move forward. And so we don't want to put that person on the defensive, we're trying to open up and invite a conversation so that we can figure out what's really going on and move forward. So if we go back to the example of you as my boss on the strengths, what if you told me, well, you know, there's some paperwork that I need to fill out in HR and I'm trying to work on this new product launch. I'm just feeling a little pressed for time. Okay. Now I can maybe meet you halfway. Well, Phil, would it be okay if maybe I took a a stab at filling out the paperwork for HR and then brought it to you to review. 
Mm -hmm. So now we can start to look for a mutually beneficial solution. We can start to really engage in that give and take. Yeah. And I like that that's a question. Would it maybe help if I meet you halfway and do this or do that? Um, And yeah, there's always, sometimes there's a tightrope where you don't want to err on the side of pushing too hard, but you don't want to necessarily push at all, but communicate. Um, and it, again, one of the seven habits, seek first to understand, understand. then to be understood. <laughs> exactly. You just need, we just need to know. Um, and I, I think it also is important around the self-esteem piece, because if you are taking what feels like a risk professionally, reaching out to someone, trying something new, um, you know, looking at this course that might feel like a little bit of a stretch for you, that takes courage. And so we don't want to immediately go to, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. We need to get back into that conversation to really know what's going on. Because nine times out of 10, they might have overlooked the email, they missed it, they got busy. It's not about you. Let's figure out what is going on so you can move forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, great, great. I love that. Uh, good. Uh, so we've we've equipped ourselves with some tools here and talked about some some patterns we can develop despite a lot of things, especially right now that that can be out of our control. Um, it, are there things we can do uh, to take a job? People talk about take any job and make it your dream job kind of thing. Well, I work at Taco Bell and I'm making burritos. That might not be anyone's dream job, but maybe it is. You know, I grew up on Taco Bell with a single dad and I liked it, but. Uh, we've mentioned them a few times here, but any, any job, it could be anything food related or like you mentioned the hospital or other things. Is there any, I, I would venture guess most people would say, no, I'm not really working my dream job. Uh, and some people, thank goodness, would probably, but is, how, how can we go about doing that to at least find more overall joy from whatever it is that mm-hmm. we're doing? Mm-hmm. And so the first step is what does your dream job look like? You know, what are the elements of that? So we'd go back to recognition, reward, we talk about strengths, we talk yeah. about development opportunities, we talk about relationships and purpose. What does it look like? And then how can you look at where you are now? So let's stick with Taco Bell. They have great nachos. <laughs> and so first of all, let's come out from looking at your job as a collection of tasks and look at it as a broader whole. Guess what? Uh, You're feeding people. That's a pretty primal basic need that you are providing. I think there's meaning and purpose in that. Okay. So maybe Taco Bell isn't exactly what you want for your dream job, but what elements in it are really fulfilling? If anything, Oh, you know what? I really like interacting with our customers. Let's pull on that thread. What is it about interacting with your customers? So I like listening to them. Sometimes they tell the stories. You know, I see them smile when they take a bite of their burrito. Okay. <laughs> so in your dream job, you want to interact more with people. Okay. How do you get better at that in your current job? Who's the best person on your team at dealing with that really angry customer? What can you learn from them? Yeah. So you've got to know what you want. And then where can you start to find pieces of it right where you are with your eye on this is what ultimately I want. How am I going to set myself up to get that? What do I need to learn? How can I reframe and grow along the way? Yeah, good. Yeah, I like that a lot. It's uh, it kind of gets back to some of what you mentioned earlier about just reframing in general, uh, which we've you know this these seem to be because I talk to a lot of folks on the podcast. I, I pull out recurring themes that oh okay, these last twelve people have said reframing and and these other <laughs> you know it, these start to become these are universal truths that we need to start to make habits in our lives. Absolutely. Because I feel like it goes back to the whole concept around stress that we spent some time around and talking about control. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, the only thing you can control is you mm-hmm. and your reaction to the situation you're in. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Nothing else. And woo, 
talk about power. You, yeah. That's powerful Absolutely. if you will own that. Yeah. And, and speaking of owning it, let's talk real quick about your book before we wrap up here. And you've got uh, some virtual event things coming up. Would you say September? Um, but yes. the book comes out in October. But the book, the title of the book is Own It, Love It, Make It Work. Speaking of owning it, uh, talk to me about all that, if you would, and the, and the virtual event. Ah, so own it. Own your part and the relationship with your employer. You are an equal contributor to that relationship mm-hmm. and have so much to give, which gives you a great opportunity to love it, which means to shape your work so that it fits your life and make it work where it up levels you and serves a greater purpose in your life and in your community. So you've got all of that. And so before the book comes out, we are launching a masterclass. It will start the second week in September. Really excited about this. And we will be taking folks through, I'm going to be coaching and training folks through each of those three, how to own it, how to love it and how to make it work in a six week program. So I'll teach one day and then we'll have like an application, I'm calling it my application coaching lab where we'll apply the concepts and strategies to your work in your life. Beautiful. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And I think probably very needed at this time. And I love that title, Own It, Love It, Make It Work. Everyone needs to go look for that and pre-order that book. <laughs> ah, thank you. Because I, yes. I, I kind of feel like, again, that title, talking about universal things, can apply in anything, especially marriage and family and other relationships too. But in light of work, especially, but own it, love it, make it work. It's like these are just action items that 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 – can underscore creating an intention within ourselves to move forward as productively and powerfully as possible and owning our power and responsibility in that process. So I love what you're doing. Um, So, and then where can people sign up for this virtual event? They can sign up at carsontate.com. So my name, carsontate.com. Carson Tate, just like it sounds, Mm -hmm. T-A-T-E. T-E.com. Did you have a hard time having the name Carson as a girl? (laughs) I (laughs) know. Oh, That's yes, my last because question. Every, your, your last question. I love how you say that from last, Phil. Yes. Um, and and you, as you can imagine, most folks named Carson are male. And so growing up, every time my name would show up on a roster or anywhere, they would assume a guy was walking in and, and then they were met with me. That's great. You threw him for a loop. Every time. I definitely did. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I like, I like that. Uh, well, good. I didn't mean to catch you off guard, but uh, beautiful name, nothing to be self-conscious of, and uh, beautiful work you're doing, even more so. And uh, we're grateful that you were able to impart such uh, great wisdom and stories and all these principles and uh, you know, help us eliminate our Sunday night scaries and all that stuff. <laughs> Uh, Phil, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for the work that you are doing in the world. And we all have so much to contribute and there is so much that all of us can offer. Yeah, that's a great final thought. And remember that everyone listening, (laughs) you have something to contribute, no matter how frustrated or downtrodden we may feel with everything going on in the world and the virus and the homeschooling and whatever. uh, Remember that you're needed and valued and We're flattered, as usual, that you spend time with us. And uh, thank you again, Carson. And go pick up the book. Again, own it, love it, make it work. The virtual event, carsontate.com. And until next time, empower yourself, empower the world around you. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Empower Humans. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review this podcast. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit empowerhumans.com. We'll catch you next time.